Good evening. Good evening. Sure, I'm glad to be here. Amen. I thank the Lord for it. You know, uh, Brother Brian got my message. I was going to preach on the little tractor and the big tractor, but he didn't got it. <laughs> I got my tractor message. <laughs> oh, God, it's been good, isn't it? Lord, it sure is good. You know, it, it's amazing to be able to stand up with the quality and uh, the preachers that I'm standing with. Uh, the best in the world. Uh, and the best of this time, I know. Maybe the best of all time. Well, thank but, you, Jen. I'd like to say a few words about that. <laughs> <laughs> you welcome, Jerry. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in everything. I'm in everything. It was all aimed towards you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But I'm glad to see you here. So it's a big crowd. This is a big crowd for me. And uh, what I'm going to teach to you tonight, or preach to you tonight, is on the book of Romans. Uh, <coughs> what did I do? I said the whole book. The whole book. <laughs> well, possibly. I mean, I'm going to cover a lot of territory there. Uh, but the book of Romans, you know, it's amazing the way God put this book together. And, uh, amen. Every time you look at it and get to looking at it, you can see the hand of God just all over it. And everything He does, every word is placed in order, and it has a purpose. And the purpose is, is to exalt His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything should be centered around that right there. And if it don't make that glorious or more glorious, then it's no good. Everything, you know, people, I, not too long ago I was looking at some stuff and when you look at the way God's Word is, it's like night time. You know, the Word of God in time is about one new moon to another new moon. You take our time, it's from one sunrise to another sunrise. He talks about the stars that are in heaven. And he talks about all the things that like... It's just totally different, like night and day, from this world. And so when we look at this book, like I said, it's, it's just unique. And I can see why that God put Romans, the, the first book, in Paul's writings. Because it just fits. Romans is probably, uh, I ain't going to say probably, it is the only book that wrote to a lost person and sent to a church where people are saved for them to read to that lost person. That is just so amazing to me. And he talks to them directly. And so in the book of Romans, I want you to look at something in the book of Romans. In Romans uh, chapter 9. Look at Romans chapter 9. Uh, Romans chapter 9. And I hope I can get this out the way I intend to. But in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, I want you to think about something in the book of Romans. And I want this to be the theme of what I'm doing, is according to the flesh. Now, in the passage again, now watch. Verse 2. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish myself were, were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kindred according to the flesh. Now watch. Whom are Israelites according to the flesh? To whom pertaineth the adoption according to the flesh? And the glory according to the flesh? And the covenants according to the flesh? And the giving of the law and the service of God? And the promises according to the flesh? Now, you, you see, everybody that I've ever talked to that tries to tell me that their spiritual Israel goes to Romans chapter 9. And I point this out to them. <coughs> Romans chapter 9 is about according to the flesh. And the book of Romans has to do with uh, the flesh and what the flesh is <coughs> and what we are and in God's eyes according to the flesh. And so in the book of Romans, you see that God Almighty is dealing with individuals that are fleshly. There are individuals that I believe that are lost. 
Look what he says to these individuals. Look in Romans chapter 2. Look in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Look at verse um, 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knoweth his will, and approveth the things which are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou... Now who's thou? It's who he's talking to, is it not? Well, these individuals, what are they resting in? They're resting in the law. And verse 18, And knoweth his will, and approveth the things which are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, and an instructor of the foolish, uh, foolishness, a teacher of babes, which has a form of knowledge, and of the truth of the law. <coughs> these people have a form of knowledge, do they not? and of the truth of the law. Well, look what he said in Romans chapter 10. Now, what I want you to see tonight is the individual that he's talking about in the book of Romans are individuals that know the truth. They have a form of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God according to the flesh. You see that? According to knowledge. But uh, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness according to the flesh. Righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Well, they submitted themselves unto God, but they did it in the flesh. They didn't do it as it is the righteousness of God. Now, when I look at the righteousness of God and think about the righteousness of God, in my mind, I don't know about you, but i got to preach what I see in the Word of God, and in my mind, the righteousness of God is a right way of thinking. To me, the righteousness of God is how He thinks, how He sees, and how He sees everything with His eyes. And so I look at uh, how God looks when I look in the book and the Bible, when I look at Romans, I'm seeing how God sees people, how God sees through his eyes, and I see how Israel seen through their eyes, and their eyes were fleshly, and they seen through the, their flesh. So if I look at this book in that light, that these people are looking through the flesh at the things of God, and Paul has given them things of God which is through the Spirit. So I want to look at this book, who he's writing to, when he's writing, and what's going on at that time. Look at Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, uh, look at verse 5. Who are the fathers of whom, as concerning the flesh, came, uh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God had none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Now what do you that? That's where they prove it. You know, we are a spiritual Israel. And I, I'm, I, and I point out to them, we're not talking about spiritual Israel. We're talking about Israel according to the flesh. That's what's in the context is according to the flesh. And Paul is laying that out, that according to the flesh, this is what they're doing. And he's saying to these people, you're following them and you're a blind guide. And you rest in the law. You actually rest in your own flesh is what they're doing. And Paul was showing them that the flesh won't just won't get the job done. God had nothing to do with the flesh. Look what it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 7. But because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children? But in, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of, the, of, of promise at this time, Will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children, now what? Being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand. Now what? Not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, it's the purpose of God. The, perfect of, the purpose of God has nothing to do with the flesh. Never had 
had anything to, the, uh, to do with the flesh. It has to do with his purpose, his grace, and people don't think about that. People think about their own purpose and their own grace, but they never think about God's purpose and God's grace. And so it's according to his purpose, according to his grace. Well, look what he says in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Do you see that? Call according to his purpose. You know, in the end, I believe, and you believe what you want, but I believe that everything here is going to go. I believe it's going to go up in permanent heat. The elements are going to catch on fire. And that's absolutely going to be nothing left. No more even remembrance of this. I believe everything that ever was is going to go. And I believe that there came a time when God Almighty just decided he'd do that. He decided that, you know, I'll add it up to here. I just can't take no more. So he's going to destroy this world. But this man called Jesus Christ stood and took the punishment of this world. But listen to me. It wasn't just this world. I believe it's everything it was. I believe that God not only was going to destroy this world, but he was going to destroy all the seraphims, the cherubims, and he was going to destroy the third heaven. I believe God is above all the heavens. I believe a type in the Bible is Moses. Right, he said, get out of the way, Moses. I'll destroy all of them. Make a nation out of you. I believe God Almighty, whenever he gave his son to die at Calvary, saved everything he ever created. I believe it's all when a when man gone crazy, angel gone crazy. I believe it's all gone bad. And it's sure and he put man here in the flesh to take back over the universe. But man failed. And God Almighty knew that before the foundation of the world. And God did what he did as far as what we see in the Word of God. And this is what I want you to see tonight. He's not revealed this to the world. And you are to feel like, you know, God, thank you for revealing it to me. He revealed it to us for his purpose, his grace. And so when I look at the book of Romans, it's like, who are these individuals, the book of Romans? You know, I believe a little different than most people. I believe that in Romans chapter 9, the apostle Paul was struck down. I believe in Romans chapter 9, let's go back to Romans chapter 9. Uh, I'm not sorry, Romans chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, he wants to go down, folks. <laughs> That's not true. But in Acts chapter 9, and I'll see right now, I'll never get all this in there. In Acts chapter 9, I can do like he's eagle. Well, he can flip on pages, can he? You know, I tell somebody today, and I don't care about all this, you know, but, you know, and, and I tell somebody today, I know I kept up with it. Whenever I got saved and went to E.C. Moore Bible study, I stood on the front row. I couldn't keep up. And I couldn't understand everything because I was too busy trying to keep up. And so it was pop, 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 pop. And so I'm sitting there going, pop, 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 and I'm trying to keep up, and I, don't, I get probably half a third of the Bible study, and I counted it. It was 31 Bible studies before I ever kept up with all the verses and understood what he said. <laughs> that was one of my happiest nights in my life, but I actually did that. You know, you know, I, I'll never get in what I got to say. But in, in Acts chapter 9, but I want to get into the thing about the flesh. So there might be somebody in here tonight that you're trusting in the flesh. And, and God Almighty called the ones around you for his purpose and grace and revealed his truth so that he might be the witness to you so the purpose of God might be carried out. I believe the purpose of God is that he has chosen and he has called those which he foreknew before the foundation of the world 
to spend eternity with them. God has chosen them, and he, he's chosen them in a way. He's chosen them through the gospel. He's chosen them through Christ. I believe everything comes through the center of that cross right there. It comes through Christ. And he chose this method before the foundation of the world, and it's got nothing to do with any of the flesh or anybody that was ever born. It has to do with his calling, not according to the flesh. And we see in this crystal ball, we look in the Word of God. We look at the truth is what's going to happen, what is happening now, what has happened. And it's like we got a crystal ball here. We got the Word of God. We got everything that's here laying in our lap that we can see. And God Almighty has showed it to us for His purpose. That just overwhelms me. And every time I pick up my book, this thing is just, oh, looky there, looky there. Why? Because God is wanting to use me as well as He wants to use you. So God opens His Word and He reveals His secrets to His servants. And if you want to serve God and you've got a heart to serve God and you want to do that, He'll open His book up. He'll make it possible for you to serve Him. And that's it, it, for anybody. He, he, he's not a respecter of person. It has nothing to do with you for Alabama or your religion. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Guy asked me one time, he said, Do you think God pays any attention to football game? I said, Nah. <laughs> no penalties in football game, does it? You know, in, in Acts chapter 9, notice something about Paul. And he gets struck down. But, and, and he has scales like on his eyes. And so he goes into the city called Damascus on a street called Straight. And uh, Ananias goes up to him and tells him, uh, look what he tells Ananias. Uh, Ananias tells him, verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, Paul, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that fall on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children uh, of Israel. Hmm. Now, he's a chosen vessel. God chose him to go before kings, before Gentiles. Notice the word Gentiles are. Notice what Paul understood about this. Go to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. I'll see you running on my different highlights of this. Acts chapter 22, look at the... Uh, this is Paul now. And look at verse 7. And I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And he, and the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. I believe when he went into Damascus there, Ananias told him what his ministry was going to be. Told him that he was going to go to the Gentiles. Told him that he was going to go to kings and told him he was going to go to the children of Israel. Did he not? I believe that Ananias told him that. I believe that he knew that for sure. Now, right after that, Paul preaches Christ straight away. And then he goes into a place called Arabia. Look in Galatians. Look in Galatians. Now the thing about it is, <coughs> how much do you believe your Bible? Now, you know, it's hard with reading <coughs> all the people that you read in the Word of God. I like what Brother Jerry said one time on Facebook. He said, when I pick up my Bible, I read it like the first time I ever seen it. God, that's good. Yeah. <coughs> Read it like the first time you've ever seen it. Look in Galatians chapter 1. And Galatians chapter 1, which is, look at verse uh, 7, or verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto another, unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that uh, trouble you, which would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
But though we are yet an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then uh, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now notice, come down to verse uh, 11. But I certify you, brother, that the gospel which was preached of me is neither after man, for neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, I know for sure that it wasn't the gospel that Paul preached. I don't care what gospel you're... That what you're looking at in the book of Acts, what you're looking at anywhere else, Paul is giving you his testimony. If Paul was to give you his testimony of how he got the gospel and what gospel he preached, he gives it to you right here and he tells you it's not a man. It's not after man and neither did I receive it of man. But note what Paul said, look in verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, as birth, and called me by his grace, Acts chapter 9, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I uh, conferred not with flesh and blood. Well, I know then that God Almighty told him right here in the passage, and it says over here, that he might preach him uh, among the heathen. Did he not? So I know Paul, at the very beginning, knows that I'm going to preach him among the heathen. No doubt with that. But notice what Paul did afterwards. Look at verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now let me ask you something. When Paul went to Arabia, what did Paul receive? The gospel of God? The gospel of Christ? What did Paul receive? What was it he received of, of Christ? I believe it had to do with the gospel of Christ. Amen. You believe whatever you want to believe. But I don't believe that Paul went there for three years and God Almighty talked about the gospel of God for three years and the things pertaining to the kingdom of God like he did with Peter. I believe to begin with when Paul come back from Mount Arabia over there, that when he come back, well not Mount Arabia, but from Arabia over there, he had the gospel of Christ. Amen. I believe he knew that and he knew the gospel of Christ. Paul, a Paul knew that before he ever went to Jerusalem. Now you tell me what he preached when he went to Jerusalem. Whatever he preached there in Acts chapter 9, it turned that place upside down. I'm telling you, look at Acts chapter 9. Look at this in Acts chapter 9. Paul's earlier trial. In Acts chapter 9, um, Look at verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the, the Jews uh, which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their lying awake was known of, of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took by him by night and laid him down by the wall in a basket. You'll find that in Corinthians over there. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. And you'll find that in the book of Galatians over there. And it was Peter and uh, 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 James is the one that he seen while he was going out 15 days in and out of Jerusalem over there. And you know something to, to, to the, what Paul says in Galatians, you know, he said that he had to leave there, and when he left there, that he was absent from the face of the churches that were there in Jerusalem, that they should see his face no more. So Paul leaves here, and when he leaves Jerusalem, and the reason he leaves is in the next verses, watch, in verse 24, but, there, but, but, there, but they lying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and, and led him down uh, by the wall into a basket. Verse 26. And when Paul, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed uh, to join himself to disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him uh, and brought him to the, where am I? And, yeah, the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and how that he had spake to him and how that he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, verse 28, and he was with them coming in and out of Jerusalem, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. When, now, which when the brother knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had, know what? Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of God and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Why did the churches have rest from Paul? Then? Why did they have rest when Paul left? Why would God put that in there when Paul left? Evidently, Paul was stirring up something at him. Paul knew for sure that he had to go to the Gentiles. He knew that. He knew he was going to the kings. He knew he was going to the children of Israel. So, well, Paul held back right there. Listen, buddy, I, I don't think Paul ever held back. <laughs> If you look at the beatings and the things, the shipwreck and all the things that he went through to preach the gospel of Christ and say he just held back on God so don't tell him no. Let me, let me ask you something about this, about Romans. I want to ask you something about it. Look, look at Romans over here. Look at this in Romans. Romans chapter 15. I just want to ask you. I want you to think about this. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Look at verse 16. Paul says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Ghost. In other words, uh, he's preaching the gospel. Uh, you trust the gospel, and you're acceptable. That's the gospel of God. I mean, he's, he, it's an offering up. He's offering up the gospel of God. It says the gospel of God, don't it? It don't. What's it say there? It says, offering up of the Gentiles as ministering of the gospel of God. Look at verse 16. That I should be ministers of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. Bless your little heart, that is, ain't it? That's the gospel of God. No argument about that, is it? Well, look at verse 17. I have therefore, I have therefore whereof I made glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I would not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ had not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have, I have fully preached what? The gospel of God, right? You sure about that? He said from Jerusalem, did he not? When, when I look at that, if, if I was to put the map on the, on the board up here, I'm going to say this is the Mediterranean Sea right here. This is the Mediterranean Sea, the land of Canaan right here. This is Galatia, and I come over here, this is Macedonia, and then you come over here, and you come over here, and this is Italy. That's Italy. Iconium, or whatever that's called, that's that territory right here. Paul said, I have fully preached the gospel of God from Jerusalem. Did it the gospel of God he fully preached? I know, but he said he fully preached it and, and over here about the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem. Did he not? All the way over to here, to here, to here, and up until that territory right there. And did he not just say that? Am I messing with something here? Yeah, you speak. Yes. Yes, he did. It. You said the gospel of God out of verse 16, and then you said, when you, after you read the gospel of Christ, you said the gospel of God out of verse 19. I did it on purpose. I know. That's so, why we said no. It said gospel of Christ. Yeah, I, I, I understand. the gospel of Christ. So, so he fully preached the gospel, did he not hear? All the way through. You know, Paul run out of church for I'm telling you, Paul didn't let up. I mean, it wasn't nothing to stop Paul. He wouldn't let Paul run out of territory. And when he read after him, when he wrote in the Romans, you know what he's saying? He said, I was wanting to come to you for a long time. I've been trying to come to you for a long time. And I'm wanting to preach the gospel of Christ to you. I'm going to run out of territory here. I fully preached it. I'm ready to come to you, you people that are at Rome. I'm wanting to come to you. I'm raring to come to you. Matter of fact, Paul says in Acts chapter 28 over there, he says in Acts chapter 20, 28 over there, he said, I'm bound for the chain. For the hope of Israel. Paul found he wanted to go there. He didn't run out of territory. He wanted to go to Rome and he was bound with a chain. You see, people read this book and I don't know, I don't know what this tradition stuff is tradition. 
And they don't read this book like Brother Jerry said. It's like the first time I ever read this book. Instead of getting all that out of your mind that suppose that you think it's happened, excuse my expression, to hell with all that. <laughs> just whatever's there. Why not just go with whatever's there? You see, Paul was wanting to go to Rome, but he's speaking to people. When I look at his epistles, when I look at the book of Acts, and I look at the epistles that he wrote in the book of Acts, he's talking to some people that God Almighty sent him to, and the ones he's wanting to go to, he's not getting to go to them. But God Almighty has his own purpose, and God called Paul according to his purpose, for his will, for his pleasure, and therefore God Almighty sent Paul where he wanted him to go. And so you'll find Paul that he's going to some people over here that know the truth and they know God. Look in Romans. Look at this in Romans over here. Look in Romans uh, chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And this has nothing to do with the flesh. This has nothing to do with what Paul wants. Nothing to do with what Paul wants. We have what God wants right here, don't we? We have his will. Amen. I know what God's good pleasure was and what God's pleasure been before he ever made anything. I'll show you that in the book of Ephesians. I know his pleasure and what God's pleasure been. Why? Because I have his word. Look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Uh, he says in, to these Romans, verse 29, For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet now obtain mercy through their unbelief. Now I'm going to add something in here, okay? I want you to catch it. For ye in time past have not believed in God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. What I add in there? In, you see that? Now let me watch when I put that in there. For ye in time past have not believed in God. It don't say that, does it? These individuals are not ones who have not believed in God. These are the ones who have not believed God. You see that? I remember showing that to a man, and he kept putting the word in. I've seen Pete Ruckman did it a lot, too. Put in God there. And I showed it to the man, and we went over this and went over this. Next time he preached, and I heard him preach, he put the word in in there. They didn't believe in God. No, these are people that believe in God. They just didn't believe God. They believed God according to the flesh. But they didn't believe God according to the way that God had laid it out and through God's eyes and through the promise that God had and the children of the flesh believe the things of the flesh, the people of the promise and the ones that know God, know God and He does it according to His promise and they look at His and those people look at the spiritual things are the children of God and not the physical things of God. And that's what He's saying in Romans. Well, when I look in Romans, look, look, in Romans chapter 9, you know what, you know what he does in Romans chapter 9? He goes all the way back to Isaac. You know what he does too? He goes to Pharaoh over there in Romans chapter 9, and he takes he talks about the foreknowledge of God, and he talks about how did he raised Pharaoh up, that was he made him king. Like Brother Steve said, and people won't get what they deserve in this election. You know, God, you know, God God's like, they like Haman, you know, Built that gallow and hung yourself. He gave him enough rope to hang yourself. God gives people enough rope just to hang themselves. And they end up hanging their own self. With their flesh. You see, when they start, you're hanging yourself. And God is trying to show you in Scripture that it's not according to the flesh. <coughs> according to the flesh, if I was to say to you tonight, if you've never heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, and if I was to walk with you and talk to you and talk to you about salvation, I said, what would you think? How would you think God would save you? You know what you'd say if you never heard about this? It's not me doing good and being good. There's no way in hell that you would ever say, I think God ought to take his son, I think you ought to put him on a cross, and I think that they ought to just beat him miserably. And you ought to send him to hell and you ought to send him down and let him just suffer down in hell. That's how I think I ought to be saved. Okay. <laughs> you see, it's not according to the flesh, is it? 
the book of Romans has to do. It's not according to the flesh. It's according to God's will. And he said, you know what he said about Pharaoh? Look at Pharaoh. Look in Exodus chapter 5. I don't know how much time I've got. Oh, 15 more. Okay. Exodus chapter 5. Look at, look, look at something about Pharaoh here. Exodus chapter 5. In Exodus chapter 5, look at verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? He didn't know the Lord, did he? Who is this? He didn't know God. Who is this Lord? I mean, who is he anyway? He had no knowledge of him, did he? He didn't believe in him, did he? He was an atheist, wasn't he? God Almighty raised him up. You know what God did on him right here? <coughs> He's dealing with an idol worship of the Gentile. That's what's going on. Amen. That was an idol worship of the Gentile right there that God is pleading with. I believe there's some things that's going on in Acts chapter 15. And Paul was trying to get some people that are the children of promise, that, that, that are, he's trying to get them to do something, and it has to do with something that over here he ends up doing it with, is the idol worshiping Gentiles over here of Rome. And I believe that Paul is not going to them, the idol worshipers of, 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 of Acts, because God is not letting him go to them at that time. He is sent over here to people who, Fear God. And he's trying to get these people over here, like the book of Romans over here, that fear God, that do fear God. He's trying to get a, one saved other, a remnant saved to those people, so that they would go to those Gentiles that are outside the covenants of promise. So Paul himself is not going there because God won't let him go there. You know why? Because God. Jesus Christ knows the best way for you to be saved and he actually all things work together for good for them that are the called according to his purpose tonight if you see that Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin that he died over there and you're free let me tell you what your problem is tonight your problem tonight is the flesh you know what Paul trying to get people to see? That their problem was the flesh. Yes, it? God Almighty created Adam and gave him the body that God Almighty wanted him to have. God Almighty never intended on you to have that body you got right now. That man don't want. <laughs> Come on, God don't like that. He don't like your body. He don't like you're in, and there's nothing you can do in this body to please him. That ain't gonna get the job done. God Almighty, all the way through his word is trying to show man that it ain't gonna get it done. If you're trusting in your flesh tonight, you're gonna burn in hell. You know what you need? You need a new body. When you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't die no more. He's got a body for you. And it's for His purpose and for His grace. And it's by His promise. It has nothing to do with the flesh. Never has and never will. That's what Paul was saying in the book of Romans. And he's trying to get some people that are sticking out their little chicken breads, crowing over here about their flesh, to see that. And you know something? He's trying to get them to see that he's long-suffering. Why? He said, look at Romans chapter 9. Look at this in Romans chapter 9. Oh, God, long-suffering with you. At one time, I was at the nuclear plant. I worked at the nuclear plant. And this guy said to me, well, he came up and I was talking to some other people there that were religious. And uh, he said, uh, we're sitting there talking about the Bible. So he comes over and he takes his branch and takes a game box and goes, 
up against the game ball box. It just rattled through the halls. Whoo! And he said, stuck that right up there like that. He said, there's a God in heaven. Let him strike down lot and strike me down right now. And those guys are religious around me, so I'm getting away from him. I'm going. I'm leaving. I'm getting away from him. And so they went trucking off down through there. And he looked at me and said, why ain't you going? His name was Skiad. He already wore Star David right there. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, Ski Daddy, the Lord had more patience with me than that. He said, do what? And I said, yeah, he had more patience with me than that, Ski Daddy. I mean, I'm nothing to, I've done a whole lot worse. I said, but you know something, Ski Daddy? Lord don't respect you. You think he's going to do what you want him to do? Let me tell you something, Ski Daddy. Let me tell you something about the, the Lord. I said, you know, and he, I know he built bars, and I said, you know what the Lord will do? When you're reaching down to get a piece of wood to go in that fire, he'll have a little bit of fire to bite you, and you'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thank you, Mr. Dad. You're going to go. <laughs> this is God and long suffering. You know that? I believe that type is in Romans chapter 9. Look at this type of Romans chapter 9. God's talking in Romans over here. Romans chapter 9. Uh, and about Pharaoh, you know, in verse, uh, <coughs> verse 15. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy. Now, mercy is something you get after you've already been found guilty. It's something you've already been found That's it. You know, God foreknows before the foundation of the world who is and who ain't. He don't make you do it. It's like him watching a movie. He knows what's going on. But he didn't, he didn't make people do that in the movie, but he knows what's going on. And so God Almighty over here had mercy. He raised up Pharaoh. Why? For the children of God to see his mercy and his grace. Ain't that amazing? I get to see his mercy and his grace. Think about it. You in here tonight, you get to see this. You get to share this with others the world. And they're the ones that God's calling right now. And they're calling him with the gospel, and you get to see it. Now, let me sit around and get through this real quick. Verse 16, so then it is not of him that will, nor of him that run, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same cause, or same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, I want you to think about something. What if God raised up Rome? Over here to take care of say if it will come low am I to show you his mercy what if he's long suffering what if as he raised up Pharaoh Pharaoh did all that over there God Almighty raised up Rome and showed mercy to the Gentiles through that he throws it through it. You know, he, he showed his long suffering and watch. Look what I'm showing to you. Pick in verse, verse um, 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much suffering, a much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Now notice in verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath? Now he's willing to do what? Show his wrath. On who? On Pharaoh. What if in the future, say, God showed his wrath? God showed his wrath back here, didn't he? It's on those over there that so didn't want, wouldn't receive the gospel. And he did it through Rome. He showed his wrath. God's long suffering as it is with the Gentiles now, is he not? Those ones of Rome over there, he's long suffering with them. He's, he's long suffering with us. He's long suffering. God's willing to know what? Uh, eight, uh, verse. To what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had uh, for prepared unto glory? Now, I believe that God Almighty is letting this go on now. Rome took it over, God's just letting it go. Why? Because there are people that will see the gospel of Christ. That we'll see his long suffering. That's what Peter finally seen about all the business. Is that God Almighty is long suffering. What if God, <coughs> with the vessels 
of glory and mercy, showed his mercy to us so we can see his long suffering through the Apostle Paul and through this time period. God long suffering in this world, is he not? Amen. He's suffering the flesh to just do anything he wants to, say anything he wants to about it. And they do, don't they? Just anything they can think of, and it's just getting worse and worse. And then the ones that are of this world, they don't see that. All they see is the things of the flesh. If you're counting on your flesh tonight, something you've done, something you've said, something you're going to do, then you're lost. Mm -hmm. Your problem is that you need a Savior. Mm -hmm. You know what he saved me from? Me. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, it says, well, it's not what goes in a man that follows a man, but it's what comes out right out of the heart to say the evil thoughts. Mm -hmm. Murder, adultery, fornication. You have those thoughts. And you have a problem. You know what it is? It's the flesh. You have a mind of the flesh. Just like I do. And you are enemy with God, according to Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says we're enemy in our minds. He took care of your fleshly problem at Calvary. Now, the only way you can be in with him is in your mind. Tonight, in your mind, quit being an enemy with God. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and he'll save you from the condition that you're in now that Adam puts you into. You can have salvation. It's free. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ saved the Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. I chopped it up, Aaron. <laughs>